Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Brightworks in another match of Beyond All Reason. Today, what I've got for you is a match that was recently played on the map that goes by the name of River Run. Tons and tons of little rivers dividing up different sections of land masses on this map, making for some good old fashioned fun and spawning right up on the front line as the blue team leader, a Cortex commander. But this game will go by the name of Planyan. Planyan clocking in at 30 true skill, no flag, I guess hailing from the depths of nowhere. Silver tail to the chevrons as well. Going to be showing us exactly what they've got on the front lines here on this map. Now this is a tricky spot and we'll get into that in just a second after we meet our red team leader, Virtual P. Also playing as a Cortex Commander, also going into a bot lab. Good stuff up here, but gonna be playing on the northern lane, which is a bit of an interesting one because it's a imbalanced lane. We've talked about that before, this sort of imbalance in maps being inherent is a, a balancing, a way, a way of keeping the matches from stalemating, essentially. It's a pretty neat mechanic, in my opinion. I think it's one of the greater ideas because oftentimes turtling up and sitting there and staring at each other's, it's not the most riveting of gameplay. I have to be a little bit critical of that. Certainly the pros are uh, often ones to exploit the weaknesses in the gaps of the armor, but sometimes on these lower level games, a little bit harder for those players to scout that out and figure out exactly where they should send their early pawns, their early grunts, their early bombers, that sort of stuff to get some really, really high level value. Similarly, of course, on the bottom side, so well, actually not similarly. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, so we've got a, huh, uh, this is actually an interesting situation. So we've got a two versus two on the bottom side. Usually what we have is a three versus two down here. And then we have a three versus, whoops, pardon me, a three versus two up here uh, in favor of the red team. But instead, we actually have Lux out here on the top side. So that's interesting. That that turns the scales ever so slightly, kind of reorients them on this northern side and back towards an even match. It means that a lot of the focus here is going to be, I suppose, right on the middle of the map. Where, yeah, we have Flibble going to be going up against Planyon. And then we have two in the back line here. We do have a bomber out already from Darth. I wonder if we're going to send that across. It looks like indeed we will. Have we done any scouting already to know where this bomber should go? No, no scouting whatsoever. So I'm guessing this is going to be a blind bomber just planning to try and target the metal extractors. It is coming in from quite a harsh angle here, actually. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine if that bomber, even if it just blindly targets this metal extractor, it might be able to take out a whole bunch of these. Uh, nope, not going to be the case. Ah, uh, we're going after the high ground here. Okay, that's a little bit of a bummer because indeed Fibble did not spawn on the high ground, instead opting for the low ground mexes and the wind turbines here, rather than those high ground mexes, means this early whirlwind will not actually find any value whatsoever up on that high ground. Yeah, okay, we're gonna fight command the bomber. Usually when you do that, it means that the bomber won't actually fire anything, and immediately the anti-air turret starts up. Yeah, this is a little bit of an awkward timing because that bomber has the opportunity here. There's no anti-air available, so it can drop a couple of payloads. There's not a rapid response right here from Fibble. There we go. We started an anti-air with the commander as well. The bomber has certainly gotten some value out, though. It's taken down one mechs and a couple of wind turbines. I think if we snipe maybe one or two more mechs, we've probably made our values worth here. The problem you have when you go for early bombers like this, especially bombers without a scout early on, is that it convinces the opponent that you're going to be very aggressive with the bombers. And what that means is they're going to all build anti-air. They're all going to prepare, essentially, to have bombers in their face 24-7. And what that means is that it's nice that we've sniped one, two, maybe three metal extractors here. Yep, looks like we will get a third one. And that is nice, don't get me wrong. It does mean that follow-up bombing attacks are going to need to be exponentially harder to, uh, or exponentially larger in order to actually break through anti-air defenses. At least they should. If the red team responds to being bombed into the Stone Age, uh, like you probably should by getting a bunch of anti-air up and running, it's going to mean that the air player has their work cut out for them on the blue side. Planion here, pushing pretty far forward here, just using those early grunts to uh, run across the map here and do a little bit of scouting, a little bit of damage, trying to find whatever they can, kind of reaching out in the darkness, these players trying to figure out where each other are. That bomber inadvertently actually worked as a really fabulous scout right here, so at the very least, Planion is aware of where those metal extractors are, where the main facility of the pink commander is, and it is an exposed location. Obviously, having your, your lab out here in the middle as opposed to up on this high ground means that it's going to be more prone to surrounds, and that's exactly what Planion looks to be lining up right here. Indeed, those grunts are going to start heading around, and this is a this is a tricky situation. One metal extractor does not quite yet justify all these grunts being sacrificed, but it's close. And the longer it stays down, obviously, the better it is here for the blue commander. Ah, you know what? These grunts are going to run up the hill, though. I think they will be able to snipe another metal extractor here. 
Yeah, there we go. Second mechs goes down, and that definitely justifies the aggression. Second batch of grunts, though, comes in and takes out the anti-air tower. That's quite nice, because if we forget to rebuild that, that can leave this base prone to aerial maneuvers. And the grunts managed to get away. Oh, no. Forces were pulled too soon from Fibble. Yeah, they were pulled back to main base to defend, but it means that these grunts managed to snipe the constructor. Oh, this is beautiful. Wonderful play right here by our blue commander, who managed to get on top of the pink player's production, and it is going to be a harsh uphill battle right now for Flibble to get back into this game. Probably the best bet would be to hand over a bunch of wind production to the pink commander so that a bunch of this can come back up and online. But no matter how you scratch it, this is a difficult game right here already for the light pink commander. Luckily, though, the saving grace is Barney Dino, or Barney Dino, or maybe just Barney, Barney No, <laughs> who does have a couple of those Rocketeers on the front line. Rocketeer is obviously the slow burn pressure maneuver. It's a very, very, very slow way of taking down your enemy's defenses. They don't move very quick and they don't do a crazy burst of damage. But over time, they can definitely be very, very valuable, especially with a couple res bots, as we've talked about before. Those res bots can turn a very valuable army composition into a damn near unkillable army composition. And obviously that's quite a bit better. Seems like that's sort of the idea right here for Mr. Solar up on the northern side. Yeah, we've got some thug production underway. I wonder if our Q has a couple of res bots mixed into it. No, we don't. We're going for Aggravator Thug, which is a very expensive comp, by the way. Usually you go one of these or the other, and then maybe mix in some grunts if you need some maneuverability to your army. Oh, Virtual P pushing up the hill right here. Going to claim this hill in the name of the Red Commanders. Beautifully done right there. Going to cement just a little bit more metal production for the Red Commander, but a very aggressive T2 transition. Ooh. I do not know about that. We have a tremendous army facing exactly right up against you on the front lines right here. I am not sure if this is exactly the time to go for that T2. We haven't even finished off the geothermal here, and we're already dumping hundreds and hundreds of metal into this advanced bot lab. This feels extremely greedy for the Red Commander. Unless we have some sort of cheeky communism play, right, where we share a bunch of metal between different commanders. I just don't see how this is going to work out. Kernard, the yellow commander here, going up against Blackbird 357 fastest plane in the west trying to shut down the yellow commander over there the yellow commander actually trapped a little bit behind enemy lines it looks like yeah this is kind of a weird situation right yeah Kernard kind of trapped over here between the lavender player and the seafoam green commander we have a little run by forces by the way a couple of grunts that have apm stalled out over here in the back line certainly could go to a whole bunch more damage to darth this is the air player so no reason why they wouldn't be able to we're getting ready to break this though sharks are circling getting ready to shut down the yellow commander here Grunts are going to step forward. They'll find the laser-bitten wrath of the yellow commander quite difficult to swallow. Mace is waddling forward as well. They'll be a little better for uh, well, for going up against those LLTs right here. Although that being said, there's only a couple of them. Yeah, one by one is not the way you want to do that. Big old pawn run by happening over here. Love the aggression coming out from the blue team. Definitely feels like the blue team is up in the red team's face, doing the very most that they can in order to keep this battle continually fought on every front possible. Mass gunship produced right here. Well, mass, quote unquote, it's three. <laughs> three banshees not constituting very much force up in the skies here. Lightning turret gonna be quite a bit better against these pawns though. Can't help but wonder though, if maybe these pawns had just run into the base of the pink player, if they would have been able to do a whole bunch more damage. And this lightning turret is gonna clean up the majority of this actually. Yeah, all said and done. Single metal extractor goes down, maybe a second one. Yeah, there we go, two mechs is down, three, four. Not sure if that really justifies the amount that we sacrificed in pawns right there, but at the very least, it is something better than nothing. A couple of uh, grunts going to step forward. Not sure why we're not capturing those tanks. A little bit more cost efficient to capture your enemy's units rather than have to uh, resurrect them or reclaim them or whatever, but either way, those tanks will be dealt with, and I'm sure that's exactly what the Seafoam Green Commander is going to be most happy about. We do have a Twin Guard up here as well, by the way. Twin Guard capable of outranging the Rocketeers, but only by a little bit. Oh, it's only very slightly. I believe the range here, yeah, 480 versus the Rocketeers range of 475. So quite literally by five range, which is not a lot in this game. Means that, that Twin Guard will fall to the substantial number of Rocketeers out here on the front line. Glad to see the aggression against Virtual P right here, considering especially that there's no army available. I'm dead if he pushes, so it's good that Virtual P recognizes that, realizes, hey, if this army actually pushes forward right here, I'm basically just showboat, or not showboating, I'm uh, grandstanding, right? I'm trying to put force up here 
when actually there is none. It's a lie, essentially. The virtual P is trying to sell to the Green Commander that there's enough units to push this back. He's just keeping them, you know, ever so slightly out of sight or whatnot. But uh, really what's happening is virtual P is focusing on this T2 transition. And the T2 lab has come up and running. So if we can get these T2 mexes up and running, if we can keep the economy scaling, eventually this is an advantage. But my goodness, it's going to take us a good long while, at least in bar terms. 9 minutes and 50 seconds, almost 10 minutes here to get the T2 Constructor is pretty impressive for our Frontliner. It's a very, very quick Frontline T2 transition. Is it a little too quick, though? We'll have to see. Definitely gonna catch Mr. Solar off guard here. Definitely not expecting the Green Commander, that is, to be going up against T2 units this quickly. This push from UX is a little concerning. The problem with a push like this... Let me stop the game, actually, because there's a lot going on down south. I don't want to miss anything, but I want to explain this. The problem with this push right here... As you can see how far forward that the purple commander is up on this line, meaning that commanders in red can push forward from the northern side. They can also push in from the southern side, and it leaves these big open exposed areas where units can just run on through into the back line from angles that otherwise nobody's really supposed to protect. Like Styles Rosa is trying to hold this line over here. We have the blue commander Planyan holding this line, losing to a bunch of maces and rocketeers right now. Every line is covered right here, but because we're so far forward, it exposes an extra angle along this side where units can push through and do a whole bunch of damage. That's why it's really difficult to do that, and that's why, indeed, we do see medium tanks in the background. Anyway, resuming replay. As it was written, the medium tanks running on into the back, or rolling on into the, into the background here. Shuriken's going to try and shut them down. They do take a couple of blasts before they're paralyzed, though. Not too many, but definitely more than a few. And there they go. Even shooting down the shuriken that are lingering out in the sky. I'll go ahead and clear my mess of markers out. Ah, despite overwhelming aggression in the early game, the blue team is really starting to crumble here. Yeah. Looks like we got a little bit over overzealous with our aggression. Kind of took inefficient trades because we had the advantage, we being the blue team. And now it feels like the red team is pushing back using that counterattack advantage. UX in so much trouble up on this front line. We have to pull out of here. I don't think this commander can stay up here on the front. Not with Shell Shockers raining down here as well. We're going for more static defense, which I really just don't think is the right idea. Putting a bunch of static defense down when already your opponent has the counter to your static defense. It buys you time, sure, but it's not really something we need right here. And then again, T2 economy is coming up. Very slowly, but very surely. Once those T2 mechs come up and running, the economy does boom. Especially if you're going to continue doing T2 units. Couple of fiends on the front line here. It's only four of them, but definitely more than enough to burn down the entire front line from Mr. Solar. The question is, when do we pull the trigger? I think you fall back about as far as maybe this last metal extractor here, and then eventually that's where you draw the line where you have to start attacking back. You don't want to give up too much metal. 1.6 metal down the drain, I mean, it hurts, but it's definitely not the end of the world. But once you can catch your enemy stepping through this water over here, it's going to slow them down a little bit, and I think that's the opportunity that we're waiting for. Anyone, the uh, Maroon Commander moving forward here, right next to Kernard. The Yellow Commander trying to take down as many of these units with the Commander Explosion as possible. Blackbird not having any of it. Moving his maces backwards to keep them out of the explosive range there of that Commander. There's another one. It could be anyone. And indeed it is. Actually manages to eat up a substantial amount of that wreckage right there. Okay. Ooh, nice snipe from the Agitator. That's actually huge. The Agitator up on the high ground here manages to snipe the Powder Green or the uh, Seafoam Green Commander on the southern side. And that actually means anyone is going to get a tremendous amount of metal back right here. This Commander has 11% HP left. 12 now. A little bit of region on those Commander, but... If that commander stays up and running and manages to reclaim all of this metal, that's a huge advantage for the red team on the southern side. An advantage I think they could almost directly translate to a T2 lab. Yeah, there we go. We've already got the T2 lab, actually, for anyone in the back line right here. Very, very confident play right there from the maroon commander, but it has paid off extremely well. If that commander had gone down for the maroon, for anyone, it's a confusing name, so I'm trying to go by their color here. That's that's the reasoning. Uh, if that if that commander had gone down for the maroon maroon color commander, it would have been really really tricky to hold that front line. But because that gauntlet or uh, agitator, pardon me, was able to hold the front lines up on the top side, I like that quite a bit. Shuriken's trying to play band aid support style. They're uh, trying to fly in and do their very best, but the fighters are pulled almost immediately, shutting all of that down very very nicely. And fiends get the opportunity to jump on a lot of this, but there is LLT support as well as some pop-up flamethrower turrets. It'll be enough to drive back those relatively squishy 
T2 flamer, flamer units. Here we go. UX has been pushed back. This is sort of the natural resonance you fall into, is if you push too far forward, it's only natural that you're going to receive way more pressure than anyone else around you. And it means you're going to be pushed back into line with your allies. Now you can use that as a strategic advantage because if a bunch of players are focusing on you, it means forces are diverted and it means other lines can gain an advantage, right? So you can, you can imagine if forces in pink have been pulled north to try and shut down UX's push right here. Obviously the blue commander or the green commander could have pushed forward very easily here and shut down the defenses. That's the kind of thing that we see in pro level matches where they'll coordinate that sort of a push and it'll all happen at the same time. Very difficult to catch on camera, so I apologize whenever I miss those. But it's a little bit harder when you're uh, A, not particularly familiar with the players that you're playing with, and B, not necessarily used to coordinating on that sort of scale. My goodness, this gauntlet can reach out for miles and miles. Yeah, I guess it's up on that high ground means it can actually reach out super, super far. All right, not bad. Fiend here burning down some of these incisors here from the blue commander. It'll eventually fall, but definitely an efficient trade. Fiends, I do believe, are 200 metal apiece. Yeah, 200 metal, 3,000 energy is extremely cheap. For reference here, the thug is 140 metal, so you pay 60 extra metal to get a way more powerful unit. Relatively squishy, mind you, but very powerful. Power in RPG terms, i.e. a glass cannon. Or in this case, a glass flamethrower. Which actually sounds really cool. I'm not gonna lie. If somebody ever has the chance to make a glass flamethrower, I hope you'll send me pictures and videos. That would be pretty epic to see. Yeah, the internal workings of a flamethrower. I mean, it's not that complicated, right? It's just a bunch of... Aeros or a bunch of fuel that gets aerosolized at the end and then ignited. I guess it's not aerosolized, is it? It's pretty much just a liquid component. I don't know how much of a how much of a flamethrower turns into a gas and how much of it turns into a how much of it stays a liquid. Probably mostly stays liquid. Flamethrowers aside, undead 14 in a lot of trouble here. <laughs> Medium takes rolling forward right now as the lavender commander is forced back. Are we going for a T2? We have not. We've got the T2 economy. Don't have the T2 lab. Critical oversight right here from the, the Lavender Commander. These T2 units are going to trade out quite nicely against the T1. If we don't get that T2 transition in soon, eventually it's going to be a runaway effect and all of these are going to trade out. You know, I say that as we're watching these Rocketeers absolutely dismantle a whole bunch of fiends down here. It's quite nice. Big old medium tank ball moving around the map here as well for the Blue Commander, trying to probably trade out these medium tanks for a little bit of value here. Difficult to find value against those T2 later on in the game, so we're probably hoping to get as much as we can with this critical mass before we're getting ready for mass T2. Uh, and actually not the case, we're not going into T2 at all, so we're just hoping to do game stabilizing amounts of damage right here. Economies are relatively dead even, but it definitely feels like the red team has an advantage with how much they push back the blue and how early their T2 transition was. I think the blue team is doing a great job of propagating T2 a whole lot quicker than the red team, though. You can see there's so many un unupgraded T2 mexes. Essentially, the entire southern side here is unupgraded T2, or unupgraded to T2. That's a complicated one, huh? All that for two mexes, probably not worth it. But it's also probably the most efficient trade you're going to find as we start to get into the T2 era here. Uh, there's also a couple more mexes we could go after. Does the blue commander spy those? Eh, not quite. Nope. Doesn't see those mechs that are up for the grabs here. We're going after Barney Dino, the pink commander here. The actual commander himself. Obviously, you gotta be quite wary of the D-gun here. Ooh. Yeah, okay. Nice. One, two. Those tanks are kind of stuck trying to get out of the water here. It's actually a great opportunity for the hot pink commander. Sorry, commander goes down over here on the right-hand side while I was looking at that tank battle. We do have uh, gunships jumping on top of the red commander right there. Actually, a nice little play from the air player. Just sending in a couple of those gunships. Very difficult to beat down. But just like that, managing to take down that commander on the front line. Definitely makes this a little bit more comfortable, especially for any vehicles wandering around. But just any units in general. Mr. Solar winning himself another commander kill up on this northern side as well. That's going to be the orange commander falling to their doom. Mr. Solar will rapidly and quickly uh, and judiciously eat up all that juicy, juicy metal. Sending it back to the labs for immediate mass fabrication. We've got the T2 lab pumping out a whole bunch of Sheldon. We're going to try and go for one of those good old-fashioned Sheldon balls. I think it's probably best if we put that into some energy production, though. Looking at 239 energy right here for the Green Commander. 
obviously because of the wind speed being absolutely atrocious, doesn't change the fact, though, that I'm sure the Green Commander would be much happier with a fusion reactor than a whole bunch of wind turbines. Banshee's somehow finding some value here. Not the unit I expected to be doing a whole bunch of damage right now, but there we go. Jumping on top of Blanion. Usually takes about 12 Banshees to kill a commander. Uh, here we go with just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There are the fighters. Okay, I was a little worried there for a second, but the fighters will eventually clean this. No, they won't. Oh my goodness. The yellow tank's coming in for the kill still right here, but the Banshee's weakening that commander up to allow him to do it. What a crazy little play right there. I don't know if I've ever seen Banshees be that effective before. Banshee's managing to soften up that commander just enough for the medium tanks to get a quick kill on the blue commander. Means that this T1 lab is going to have to spam out units as quickly as possible here. But there's only so much it can do. We're going for an advanced geo up on the high grounds, but it doesn't even matter. There's not even enough metal for it. I think this will be held eventually because there's enough production to shut down these medium tanks. But it is still a devastating hit to the front lines right here of the blue team. Styles Rosa was starting up a bulwark. Have no doubts that that's going to ever, or I, uh, I doubt significantly rather that that's ever going to come up and running. Fat chance indeed. Big Sheldon Ball starting to accrue weight here. Not quite to the point where it can essentially engage against any unit, but this is pretty good. Firing away at any of these units in the distance that they can. Just a little bit of damage, but when you have enough of them, doesn't matter what they're going up against. They'll just blast it down regardless. Mammoth here are going to start contributing some heavy laser fire. That's quite nice. Okay. I can see that helping out quite a bit. And shell shockers push to the fronts. <laughs> a little bit of a missed micro right here from Barney DNO, who is actually throwing away a lot of metal on the front needlessly. Sheldon have to stay far away from this, or far enough away anyways, that they're out of range of a lot of these units. It means that they can't really tank on the front lines, but they really shouldn't be, so it's fine. Yeah, they're going to take down a lot of the cursory units, but still this main globule of stuff remains standing. Mammoth's going to be quite good for blasting it down, but it is a uh, single beam weapon, meaning it doesn't do very much AoE damage. I.e. does no AoE damage. This all gets cleaned up relatively quickly here, but it definitely hurts for the blue commander. Production has fallen. It's going to be difficult to get back in. At this point, we're up to T2 on the southern lanes as well here. Still T1 for the Lavender Commander, surprisingly. We are up on a T2 Metal Extra- or sorry, a T2 Bot Lab here. Just barely getting some of those units out. We've gone for a Fat Boy into the Archangel. Two Fat Boys, actually. Not the end of the world, but definitely slow. Sheldon the Ball, meanwhile, manages to snag a Commander kill. So easy to lose those Commanders once the T2 really start coming out in mass. This is an imposing Sheldon Ball, certainly. We are, we are hitting that critical mass where suddenly it's very, very difficult to get those Sheldon to... Uh, or sorry, to shut down those Sheldon. Stop them from ravaging anything that they can fire at. Uh, yeah, Resbot's moving forward here. Gotta be careful with those. You don't want to lose them needlessly. They are quite expensive. 110 metal per Resbot. There we go. Mass resurrection happening right here, trying to pick back up all these units and get them folded back into the armies of the blue and the green. Metal extractors being resurrected here. Trying to uh, pick these up and hand them back. I told you so many times they have on me, but you still let me play alone. I think, I think he's saying that there's a lot more fighting him than, than, than one. <laughs> trying to trying to infer here. Obviously, English might not be everybody's first language, so I'm not judging. I'm just I'm trying to figure out what the, the call-out is here. I think it's a complaint that we haven't sent units up to the northern side to support all too much. Uh, I believe unit support will be coming, though. Yeah, looks like Enterox is eventually getting those T2 units out and running. We do have a bunch of fiends that are produced over here. One of the red commanders actually tapping out of the game at this point. Looks like it's our uh, light pink player who's going to be shut down by this big old Sheldon Ball marching forward. That's quite nice. If we can pop this second production facility over here for the hot pink player, I think that definitely secures the middle of the map. Buys the time that the blue commander needs to rebuild here. Also allows you to shut down a lot of the production. Maybe even get on top of a whole bunch of the air production, and that would be quite nice. Allow you to go for some bombing runs, that sort of thing. Very, very good. Yeah, this is looking fabulous. Big Sheldon Ball has hit that critical snowball -y mass and is now moving across trying to do a whole bunch of damage. The push on the northern side is very, very slow. 
means that uh, eventually it'll collapse on top of all these forces. Mr. Solar is building up a nice little economy right here. Yeah, we've got a nice economy. We've got a good amount of Sheldon up on that side as well. This is where it's all at. Sergeant Monkey moving forward. Or trying to. Gotta be careful. Moving around with the Commander Cloak costs you a thousand energy per second, so it's definitely very, very expensive. Not the end of the world, but very expensive. Sergeant Monkey is not moving around, though. So the Sheldon will continue their march all the way into the back line. Oh. <laughs> Dodging the Sheldon fire here. A tricky dance because those Sheldon do fire so many projectiles. Down goes the Orange Commander. These Sheldon have absolutely free reign to move in here. There's a big old Sheldon ball. A bunch of T1 mixed in here. Some Arbiters as well pushing forward on the middle of the map trying to counter pressure all this. But I really don't think it's going to matter. There's just so many Sheldon pushing forward here. Ravaging this backline eco center that was set up for the Hot Pink Commander Barney Dino. The uh, DME Hot Pink player. Just like, just realized there's a bunch of players in the DME. <laughs> DME clan or DME team. Trying to work together here. No anti air in this mix. Uh, but fighters are pulled to shut down this gunship, so that's quite nice. These are T2 Fix going up against T1. Gonna be a good trade right there for the air commander. Yeah, just like that. The Sheldon have shut down a tremendous portion of the economy here. Wow. What a crazy, crazy comeback right there. The blue team was absolutely losing it on all fronts here, but that push right through the middle of the map managed to find just a weak enough link to break through using those Sheldon. Just caught those players and just, just shy of that full-blown T2 transition meant that those T1 units couldn't necessarily clean the majority of it up. We do have a little bit of a split over here too, which is quite nice. And there we go, those Sheldon marching into the back line, shutting down all this economy. A solars are gonna fall and that really is the key part of this infrastructure, holding all the energy together right here for the hot pink commander, just like that. The energy will crumble. Sheldon continuing to march north northward as well, but this massive swell of pawns moving forward going to be quite nice for cleaning up all the rest of this. Bunch of fiends jump on top of the uh, red commander, the resuscitated red commander over here. Resuscitated and or uh, handed over. Either way, red commander falls for the second time this game. And these pawns are continuing to run across the map. Beautifully, beautifully done. It's rare that we see the middle of the map break because obviously it's right in the middle. It's the closest distance from either of the outsides to support, but neither of the outsides did indeed support. And indeed, it left the middle of the map completely exposed. And now, in abject ruin. Resbot's moving across to eat up this juicy pocket of metal. 4,000 metal right there. Beautifully done. Shuriken pulled against a bunch of fiends over here, turning this into a very efficient fight for even the T1 one of those superpowers of the T1 Cortex Air. Oh, T2 Constructor caught too far forward here as well. That's a nice pick. Managed to shut down that good old T2 Constructor. And here are the Shurikens. I like the Shurikens. I like the late game Shurikens here. It's easy to transition out of Shurikens and forget how efficient they really can be. But in mass droves, they can shut down things, even some of the, the heavier things, the, the T3, T2 type of units with relative efficiency. Relative anyways to the EMP bombers which have been reworked. Certainly more efficient than those. Okay, we <laughs> we tried to self DD fiends right there. We self DD them in mass. That's a uh, that's a common problem, right? You hit your hotkey and then you try to select a few of them but fail. And then you hit self D and actually blow up your entire line of fiends all the way back to your base. I've done it. You've done it. Anybody who's tried to control those fiends has done it. <laughs> it's just one of those things that happens. Yeah, the shuriken getting so much value here. So much value. Why are these Sheldon missing so much? There we go. Finally prioritizing the right unit here. Fiend's gonna burn away most of them, though. Uh, I think we need to transition into... So oh, we went for an Aphis. I think full-blown unit production is probably the... The right, right idea here. These shuriken are keeping it together, though. All we have to do on this northern side is hold. Everything across the southern side is burned away, and just like that, there we are. The red team decides that the pressure is too much. They've lost too many teammates. Too many loved ones have fallen before them to the blue menace. And indeed, the blue team will claim victory in this game of beyond all reason. What a cool back and forth match. Really couldn't predict it until that run by in the middle of the map there. Absolutely mowing down multiple pink players. I guess they uh, had enough of the pink menace 
decided to eliminate them from the game, and indeed, Antarox earning the golden cow for doing everything. What a lovely showing. If you enjoyed this game, I would appreciate it if you hit the like button down below. Only takes you a second, but it means the world to me, and I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out, everybody.